Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning to those online as well. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer. And then we'll get into our sessions. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for your word that empowers us. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to come and learn from your word. Lord, even as we learn together about the work of the Holy Spirit, we pray, God, that you would work in our lives, that you ready our hearts, oh God, that every word that goes into our hearts will be like seed planted in good ground to bear fruit in each of our lives. Help us, Lord, to and give us the wisdom to understand everything that we learn and study during this time, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So last class we looked at chapter 8. Yes? So we looked at the work of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. Now what, what does the Holy Spirit do? Since you and I as believers... Uh, as believers, what is the role of the Holy Spirit? So we looked at quite a few points. One, we looked at new birth, uh, where we are, where when we become believers, we're born of the Word and born of water, which is the Word, and born of the Spirit, right? Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So the moment we pray and we accept Jesus as our personal Savior, the Holy Spirit comes into our life and testifies with our spirit that we are the sons and daughters of God. Right? There's a testification happening there right? at new birth. He gives us the assurance of our salvation. Very important. The moment we become believers, we are assured of our salvation. The devil cannot come and say, okay, now since you have sinned, you will come with me to hell. No. The Bible also says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. So the Holy Spirit is in us, testifying of us, the assurance of our salvation. This boy or this, this person, this man or woman is a child of God. And that's this assurance. Nobody can take that assurance away from you. No government, no persecution, no challenges, no work of the enemy can take that assurance from you. Unless you give it. Unless you and I say, yes, it's true. I'm not a believer. I, you know, I believed in Jesus, but now I don't believe. It's all you know, made up stories. If I say that, then that's not my problem. But there's an assurance. The Holy Spirit is saying, you are sealed. For salvation. Then in everyday life, the Holy Spirit brings holiness and sanctification. Right? The moment we are living as believers, He wants us to live a holy life. Right? He wants us to live in victory, in sanctification. Right? That means we set aside apart, set ourselves apart. We are not like the world. We are of the world. Right? But we are, sorry, we are from the world, but we are not of the world. Meaning what? We're here. We're living in this world. There are people from different faiths. We have the work of the enemy that is all across us. We can see it everywhere. Yet, we are not of the world. We are different. We are set apart. We are sanctified for the purposes of God. Now, this is... The Holy Spirit enables us to fulfill this. If we try to go and do this on our own, we will not be able to do it. That's, the, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. So we're living. Suddenly we may you know, go through temptations. We may fall into sin. The Holy Spirit brings conviction. He says, hey, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So, so confess your sins and he will wash your sins away. And then he brings you back into this place of sanctification and holiness. Secondly, we are walking in the spirit. We're walking filled in the spirit. Right? So we talked very importantly about the fruit of the spirit. Right? Nine fruit of the spirit that you and I can walk in. 
we can work in all nine of them right uh, and then we walk in love we're walking in the power of the spirit we're walking in and it gives us liberty then we see the work of the holy spirit uh, the revelatory work of the holy spirit so what does he do he reveals things to us the holy spirit can speak to us in different ways through the word through prophecies through dreams through visions through people he can stir in our hearts he can put a thought in our heart he can put a thought in our mind he can enable us to see things that he wants us to do right so he reveals what is the meaning of reveal something that is hidden he reveals it to us right so for example we are praying lord after i finish bible college i don't know what to do give me the wisdom speak to me tell me what should i do so when we are praying the holy spirit one of the role of the holy spirit is to reveal the will of the father so what he'll do he he, he may speak to you he may put a thought in your heart he may open doors for you again we must be sensitive to that leading okay so few more points here we stop there next the holy spirit enables us to pray everyone say prayer and i always say this on the pulpit or pulpit ministry prophecies word of knowledge healings deliverances are all very public people look and they and they you know clap and they appreciate and you know they it's a it's a ministry of people watching and it's very easy to boast about the gifts that god has given us but prayer there is no boasting in prayer praying in secret the holy spirit enables us to pray let's read a couple of verses romans 8 26 and 27 romans 8 26 and 27 go ahead whoever has the mic can read please to 27 Likewise, the Spirit also help us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings, groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Right. That passage is so powerful. It says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. So, as believers, we may not be able to pray for a long time. Right? Or we don't know what to pray. We don't know how to pray. Especially in our weakest times. In times when we're going through difficulties and challenges we don't feel like praying it says here the same way the spirit helps us in our weaknesses we don't know what we ought to pray for but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot be expressed this is a key role of the holy spirit remember this our flesh is weak right flesh is weak the flesh wants many things and then there's the soul where the soul is burdened weary in sorrow in pain and we don't want to pray we cannot pray we can do something very simple all we have to do is say holy spirit i'm unable to pray now i want to pray I want to spend time in your, in your presence, but I'm unable to pray. So what does he do? He comes and he speaks, intercedes on behalf of us. He, his spirit, the Holy Spirit, testifies with our spirit and he begins to pray. Now, many of us know the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is speaking in tongues, right? Now, it is good that we desire these gifts. Right? Because these gifts will enable us. So the scriptures here say, oh, the Spirit intercedes for us 
with groans that we cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance to God's will. So when the Holy Spirit is interceding on our behalf, he's praying according to God's will. Now, there are many times, you know, we can be praying. We're asking God for a decision. We need wisdom for something to do. But we are praying about something else. The Holy Spirit can give us an answer for a prayer that we are making, you know, six months ago. Right? So we've been praying. We are, we are asking God for something. Maybe this is six months ago. And then now you're praying. You're thinking about something else. But the Holy Spirit can give you an answer to a prayer that you made six months ago. There are times that has happened, you know, just sitting in prayer. And just that moment, I got to know what should I do in this situation? Or what step I should take? The Holy Spirit reveals the will of God. Right? Prayer must be motivated out of love of the Spirit. Romans 15.30. Romans 15, 30. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. Yeah, so look at this, what Paul is saying. He's, he's talking to the church. He's saying, I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit. And by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. This is one of the few times the Apostle Paul is saying, talking to the believers, and he's saying, Pray for me. He's saying, Here, I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of our Spirit. When we are praying, prayer must be motivated out of love. If I'm praying for my family, it's definitely motivated out of love. If I'm praying for my children, it's definitely motivated out of love. But what about when I'm praying for my friends? What about when I'm praying for people who don't like me, who persecuted me? What about when I'm praying for my leaders who I don't, you know, maybe you don't even like them? Prayer must be motivated out of love. Very important. Prayer gives us access to the Father. Ephesians 2.18. Ephesians 2.18. Go ahead. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Oh, wonderful. For through the Holy Spirit... You and I have access to the Father. It's so powerful, right? Imagine, in the Old Covenant, let me paint a picture for you. In the Old Covenant, once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest, one high priest, will go into the Holy of Holies with the blood of the lamb or a bull, and he will pour that blood on the on the off on the altar and he will come out that is to signify that the nation of then when when the god when god sees that he will say okay your sins are forgiven as a nation it's called the day of atonement now before that day there is a lot of preparation that this priest has to go to he has to confess his sins he has to cleanse himself his thinking his his body his mind his words everything he must have asked for forgiveness for all of that. Now, if he has sinned, he will drop dead right there. Why? Because he's entering into the most holy place. It's called the Holy of Holies. Remember the song that we, have, we sing at times? I enter the Holy of Holies. I enter through the blood of the... I enter... Through the blood of the 
Now, this is the old covenant. He's going shaking in fear. I hope nothing happens to me. I hope I live. I hope and I pray that, you know, uh, once I make this offering, I can get out of this place as soon as possible. And I know that God has forgiven the sins of the nation of Israel. Now, in contradiction, look at what Jesus did. He went into the Holy of Holies, took his own blood, and he made atonement for all of us. And through his spirit, we have access to the Father. Now think of this, you know, remember the disciples came to Jesus and said, Jesus, teach us to pray. What did Jesus say? Our Father who art in heaven. Now this is a big prayer. Now for us it's easy, our Father, after the cross. But for them, for the Jews, it was something that is too difficult to comprehend. Wait a minute, Jesus, you're calling God the Father, God, Yahweh, the Jehovah God, the great almighty God, the God who stood and spoke through Moses through the bush, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're calling him Father. As a Jew, if I had heard that, I would have said, this is not right. We can't be in that kind of a relationship right now. There's sin. But after the cross, we have access to the Father. Through whom? Through the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit inside us reveals what the Father wants to do in our lives. Right? Everyone with me? Okay. Then we have the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6, 17. Ephesians 6, Paul is writing about the armor of God. And take the helmet of salvation. And the sword of the spirit, mm. which is the word of God. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So when you're praying, the Holy Spirit can testify of the word. The sword of the spirit. Remember Jesus? He's being tempted. What happened? All three times he used the word. All three times he defeated the devil by speaking the word. Now, when we are in prayer, we are maybe praying or we have, you know, we, we are unable to pray. When the Holy Spirit can speak the word, can stir up in us the word of God, which has the which is the sword of the spirit. So, for example, you wake up morning, you're unable to pray, you're tired. Weak, feeling tired, say, God, I can't pray. Feeling very tired, Lord. And then what the Holy Spirit will do? He'll begin to speak the word of God into our spirit. So all I can all you can do at times is, you know, sometimes what, what I do is I just speak the word. All the verses that I know, just speak it. The sword of the spirit. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty in God. They bring down strongholds. Right? Uh, I have the mind of Christ. The wisdom of God is formed within me. Right? Uh, so many verses that you can use. Just speaking the word. Right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I do not have a spirit of fear and, or, but of power, love, and sound mind. What am I doing? The Holy Spirit is stirring my heart to speak the word. And I'm able to pray now. I'm able to spend time in his presence. Right? Now, very important. If the Holy Spirit has to speak to us through his word, we must have the deposit of the word inside us. Yes or no? Right? When we have the deposit of the word, it's like, you know, these bits. You write a chit, you keep it in a cup. I say, one, each one of you come, take one. And that's yours, you know, these promise verses. So it's like that. We are a cup and we've got the word of God inside us. The Holy Spirit, while ministering to us, he'll pick up a word. Say, speak this word. Or he'll pick up this verse. He'll say, say this. Now, for that, we should have it in, inside of us. Right? Now, God is also sovereign. He can speak to us beyond our understanding. But 
most of the time he speaks what we have right so for example i'm praying say lord i feel alone i feel this my life is going nowhere I feel like i have no future everyone who sees me they, they, they reject me or i don't see myself doing anything good and i'm just sitting that moment the holy spirit will say paul say jeremiah 29 11 and i say okay for i know the plans i have for you plans to prosper you plans to give you a good hope and a good future what happened all of a sudden that feeling of you know loneliness or that feeling of fear about the future just goes away because you're speaking the sword of the spirit right all kinds of prayer ephesians 6 18 praying okay. all, with, Pray all, all with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching there unto with the perseverance and supplication for all saints. Yes. Thank you. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. On all occasions, pray in the spirit. Now, this is very interesting. How many of us pray on all occasions? Say, Pastor, one occasion only is not happening, <laughs> difficult. But the Bible says pray on all occasions. So you can be sitting in the van going to APC North. What can you do? You can pray. Right. Listening to songs, that's good. Worship songs, that's also good. But you can pray in the Spirit. You can ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Right. Now you have a choice. You can make a ruckus and keep fighting with each other, keep talking the entire one hour journey. Or you can tell your friends, don't trouble me. I'm praying in the spirit. Now they'll call you, oh, next holy, uh, next Jesus you're becoming. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. So you got to stand up for some things in your life right you do some things you say okay lord now i'm going to get picked up i'm going to go all the way to north it takes half an hour half an hour i'm going to pray in the spirit you help me to pray lord there's going to be sound there's going to be people talking i want to pray in the spirit right so on all occasions wherever we are we can pray in the spirit and sometimes People ask me, who do you talk to? You'll be in your own world. Sometimes I don't look left or right also. I don't see who's in front of me at times. Why? Now, it, people may think it's rude. Say, hey, this person's got too much attitude. Just because he's a pastor, he's not looking, he's not wishing everyone. Now, many times, it's because I'll be thinking of something, talking to the Holy Spirit. And whether he answers or no, that is different. But I'm just talking to him. So, Holy Spirit, and before coming, I said, today, very tired, Lord. I just want to go home. Now, remember, the Holy Spirit is hes a person, right? I can tell him whatever I want. Will uh, the Holy Spirit say, no, open the book of, is only speak to me about the Bible. No. You got to build a relationship with him. Sometimes I'll just, I'll just be talking to him. I'll be sitting in the car, I'll be sitting outside at work, or sitting anywhere, just talking. Holy Spirit, this is something that I have to do. And then he reminds me of things that I have to do in my work, or things that I have to do for my family. He reminds. Right? Prayer releases the supply of the Spirit. Philippians 1.19. Beautiful. For oh, I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit through Jesus Christ. Look at that. 
so powerful when we pray the lord jesus there's a supply of his spirit into our lives that means what he's just pouring out into our lives you take it this is yours he's pouring out into our lives right next one he, it keeps us in the sorry prayer releases yeah that's done keeps us in this in the love of god Right? Again, we talked about that. Prayer keeps us in the love of God. We, we stay in a place of love. Even though we may not agree with people, we may not agree with things that are happening, right? we may not agree with world leaders and the government and all that they are doing, but we continue to stay in a place of love. Right? There was a time when God spoke to me very clearly. I was so upset. With, I used to get upset with our nation. Why are things like this? You know, I've traveled to many different countries. Things are so nice there. Why can't, why can't it be here in India? Why can't people think? Why can't people understand basic common sense? Have you felt that? A basic common sense. Basic, simple. You take a, you eat a chips packet, you take it to the dustbin, even my five-year-old's Son knows that and throw it in the dustbin. Basic concept. So I used to think, well, what is this? Why, why are people like this? They're educated people. They're going in the car, they just throw it on the main road. It's the main road, it's a highway. Okay. So I used to get very upset. There came a time when God just changed that, said, No, you got to. You've got to change that hatred that you have for all of this. You may not agree to what they're doing, but you cannot hate them and yet pray for them. True? Right? I was upset, but I cannot hate them. So I had to really deal with that in my heart. I said, God, so when I see people, first thing I do is I pray. I say, God, you bless them. Please give them some wisdom. What else to do? Because I have to remove that anger. So I started praying a lot of, you know, I spent a lot of time praying for our city, for our nation, praying for good leadership. Right? Uh, and these are things that God will put in our hearts. Right? So prayer is a very important aspect uh, uh, and, uh, of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Right? OK, other dimensions of the Christian life. Let's just go a little quick. Worship in the spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit enables us to worship Him in the Spirit. We are abounding hope. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into one spiritual body, that is the body of Christ. When we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, there are two kinds of baptism. There's the water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we are baptized, we are baptized into one spiritual body, the body of Christ. So when the Lord Jesus sees us, he doesn't see us as one Methodist, one Pentecostal, one all of these denominations. It's not how Jesus sees us. As believers, the Lord Jesus sees us as one body. Our beliefs may be different. These are all man-made. When Jesus looks at us, he says, this is my child, and he or she is baptized into the church, into one body. Let's read that verse, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. First Corinthians 12 and 13. For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we are all given the one spirit to drink. So Paul is writing here. He's writing to a church, which is a church of mix, a mixed church, Jews, Greeks, Gentiles, everyone are there in this church. And he's saying we are baptized into one body. So it doesn't matter what background we are from, what language we are, what culture, what race, all of that don't matter. I baptized into one body, right? Then 
we have communion and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Second Corinthians 13, 14. The okay. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communi communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. So Paul is giving the benediction. He's saying, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship or communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Right. So in Christian life, remember, this communion is, is established through relationship of talking. Now, when example, you all have come here as students. They in the first week, did we know each other well? Only knew each other, right? But over time, we started to get to know each other. Many of you have come and they've spoken to me, and I know your names. I, I know many of you. Where are you from? Right? A little relationship. Now, as time goes on. Right? If you're here for the next year, we'll get to know each other more. And then by the third year, we will know each other very well. What happened? We are building fellowship with each other. right? And this is our responsibility as believers that we build relationship or communion with the Holy Spirit. Then we experience, we receive and experience the work of the Holy Spirit by faith, so we won't go into the passages, but let's let me just explain this. We receive the work of the Holy Spirit. What is the work of the Holy Spirit? All the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. All of this is received through faith, believing that when I pray or when I seek the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will begin to release these gifts. Now these. Gifts are not to given to us to make a big show of ourselves. The gifts of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is given to us for the building up and the equipping of the church. Yes? Now, for example, there is a person who's prophetic, very prophetic, right? Now, it doesn't mean that he or she is superior to those who are not prophetic. Maybe there's somebody else who's got the gift of healing and deliverance. It doesn't mean he or she is better than somebody who just reads the word and prays every day. Remember, our gifts, the gifts of the Holy Spirit does not determine our spiritual maturity. All right? Everyone hear that clearly? The gifts of the Holy Spirit does not determine our spiritual maturity. You can have people who are flowing in the prophetic and flowing in you know, healing and deliverance, yet act, yet act foolish. Right? It's not a sign of spiritual maturity. You can be one month in the Lord, and God can release that gift. The Holy Spirit can release the gift of prophecy through you. He can do it. You may not know anything from the Old Testament, New Testament, but he can release the gift of prophecy. Just because somebody prophesies doesn't mean he's spiritually very mature. Just because somebody prays for healing and deliverance doesn't mean they're very great. No. These gifts are given to us by the Holy Spirit to equip one another, to build each other up, not to bring competition, not to bring divisions. How do we know that? Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. He's saying, we have all these gifts, no love. There's no use of these gifts. Everyone with me? We thank God for the gift of healing and prophecy, word of knowledge. It's good. We need it. That's how God works. He works to the supernatural. But that is not a sign for spiritual maturity. It's not a sign that you and I are greater than somebody else. No. If I know how to minister in the prophetic, I must be able to teach it to others or help them to learn and grow in that. If the Lord has given me the spirit of teaching or I can learn I, and you know to teach, I must be able to impact others to teach. 
It's not like, okay, I, I'm the teacher, so all of you must only listen to me. No. Right? We experience, we receive and experience the work of the Holy Spirit through faith. We build each other up. Then, um, in the Christian life, the Holy Spirit is uh, dwelling, is a dwelling place of God. Um, it, it strengthens our inner man, Ephesians 3.16. Let's go there. It strengthens our inner man. Should I read? Go ahead. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Yeah. So it says that. Uh, Is this Galatians 3.16? Oh, it's Ephesians 3.16. Ephesians 3.16. Yes, yes. Sorry, let me get to that verse. That he will grant you, according to riches of his glory, to be strengthened with mind by, the, by his spirit in the inner man. Yeah. So, it says here, the Holy Spirit strengthens our inner man. Now, everyone say inner man. Now, now, you and I, our spirit, we have a soul, we live in a body. Okay? We are spirit. We have a soul, we live in a body. The body will die, right? It'll just, it's just flesh. It'll go away. But the real person is our spirit, our soul, which is interchangeable. Now, when we become believers, the Holy Spirit, here the word inner man simply means our spirit, our inner person, who we really are. The Holy Spirit strengthens our inner man. If you read the scriptures and you look at people like the great apostle Paul, and you look at you know, believers who have done great things for the work of God. How are they able to do it? It's because the Holy Spirit strengthened their inner man. Look at William Carey. Look at Henry Martin. I shared about Henry Martin, right, last time. Died at age 31. Translated the entire New Testament in Arabic, in Hindustani, and in Persian. Three versions of the entire New Testament by one man. You think it's easy? Is it easy? Is it, is it some easy task? It's not like what, what we are doing now. We have one Bible. You can translate it just using Google and all of these. Nothing. No AI, no Google, nothing. He sat probably in a candlelight sitting and translating the Bible. Tiring, tiring, tiring. Easy to give up. But strength of the inner man. William Carey came into India. He wanted to do missions. And he came and he did so much. He started a printing press. A couple of years down the line, the printing press was burned down. Everything burnt. All the efforts that he put in, gone to nothing. Now, it's so easy to give up. No, okay, I'm done with this. Let me just pack my bags, go back home, do a peaceful ministry there. You know what happened? He said, no. What we'll do is we'll restart. We'll do a new printing press. Now, where does that strength come from? The Holy Spirit strengthens our inner man. Right? Now, next thing. Uh, there's unity among God's people. Enables us to hold on to the things committed to us. Very important. 2 Timothy 1.14. The Holy Spirit enables us to hold on to the things committed to us. Go ahead. 2 Timothy 1.14 That good things which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Mm. The good things committed to you, keep it by the work of the Holy Spirit. Sorry, uh, I like my version, the NIV version. It says, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. How do I guard it? 
Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who rests in you. So, example. You're praying and somewhere you feel the Lord is calling you to be a pastor. Now, it's a deposit that is there in you. So, you have to guard that calling. Yes or no? Right. Okay. God, if this is what you want me to do, I entrust this calling to you. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, you enable me, teach me, help me to understand your word, help me to pray, help me to live an honorable, holy life. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, you open the right door for me because I don't know what to do. So you open the door for me. I will do my part, my responsibility, but I entrust this gift of the pastoral calling. I entrust it to you. I give it to you. Maybe some of you are worship leaders. Say, God, I entrust it to you. You help me to guard this gift because the enemy can come and steal it away from you. Meaning, he, he can't steal the gift away, but he can steal it by the thoughts that he brings. Right? Said, Paul, you can never stand in front of people and preach. How is that possible? You have never stood on the stage as a small boy. You cannot stand in front of people. Now, if I listen to that, what will happen? Not entrusted the gift and the call of God to the Holy Spirit. Everyone get what I'm saying, right? If it's teaching, if it's women's ministry, men's ministry, whatever, prayer, entrusted to the Holy Spirit. Say, God, you, you guard it. As I do my part, you help me to guard this. That's what Paul is talking to Timothy here. Now, remember, Timothy is the pastor of the church. He's telling Timothy, now you're the pastor. Timothy, you were 17 years old. You were a young boy. I took you for my second missionary journey. You saw the way ministry is done. Now you're grown up. Probably in his early 30s, you're grown up. You've become a young man now. So you have to guard the deposit which was put inside of you. Got it. Look after it. Okay. Uh, then the Holy Spirit enables us to obey the truth. He enables us to obey the truth. We get into God's word. We read God's word. God's word is truth. But then the, the enemy is an accuser. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He'll try to bring confusion and lies into your life. But what does the Holy Spirit do? He enables us to obey the truth. It's okay to you know, lie once a while. The Holy Spirit will say, no. You don't have to do this. Obey the truth. Obey what God says. It's okay to in, indulge in you know, sin once a while. Once a week is fine. But the word, the Holy Spirit will tell us, no. So what the word says, you should not be doing this. Right? So he enables us to obey the truth. He enables us to endure persecution. Persecution is not fun. It's challenging. Many of you are from North India and you've seen it firsthand. Right? It's not fun, but he enables us. He gives us the grace. The Holy Spirit gives us the strength to go through these seasons of persecution, especially as a church. Now, persecution can happen to a church, can also happen to us in our personal lives. But he enables us, he endures us. Then the Holy Spirit, uh, then, he, then that is despising the Holy Spirit, meaning when we look down on the Holy Spirit and say, I don't want this, or people ridicule and mock you, right? Um, these are things that happen. But we need to stay strong. So the Holy Spirit also, uh, we are led by the Holy Spirit. As, as a shepherd leads his sheep, the Holy Spirit leads us in the things that we must do. Right? Example, we say, who is the worship leader? So what does the worship leader do? He starts the song. He leads the people into singing, gives them the right key. He leads the congregation into worship. The same way the Holy Spirit leads us in every area of our life. Romans 8, 14 through, 14 through 16. 
Romans 8, 14 through 16. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Okay, let's stop there. For those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. If you reverse it, those who are sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. So we are sons of God. We are children of God. So we must be led by the Spirit of God. right? Then our conscience bearing witness to the Holy Spirit. Very important. Romans 9.1. I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. Mm, this is very important. My conscience bearing witness to the Holy Spirit. Okay, what is conscience? Now, for example, when we do something or when we are going to do something that is wrong, right? Our conscience tells us not to do it. Now, this is this is some okay. For example, I'm at the supermarket, and there's a you know I'm checking out, but there's a you know there's a, probably a packet of chocolate or a packet of chips there. Now, if I take it without paying, nobody knows. But my conscience, my mind tells me, hey, stealing is wrong. It may not, you don't need the Holy Spirit for that. Yes? Basic, your conscience will tell you stealing is wrong. Murder is wrong. Right? It's conscience, just your mind telling. You don't have to be a believer to understand this. So we all have a conscience. So Paul is saying here, I speak the truth, I'm not lying, and my conscience confirms it with the Holy Spirit. That means... My mind is also saying, even the Holy Spirit is saying, two people are saying, this is right and this is wrong. So I've got to listen to what. So Paul is saying here, I'm speaking not of my own sense, not my own understanding. My conscience also is telling what I'm saying is true because I'm bearing witness to the Holy Spirit. Right? Next class, we'll talk about how the Holy Spirit speaks to us through our senses. Right? Quickly, how to test what I feel is the leading of the Holy Spirit. One, does the spirit and the word agree to each other? The word, the, the Holy Spirit and the word of God are one. They must agree to each other. Two, is Jesus glorified in all of this? If I am bringing a prophetic word, if I am bringing a word of knowledge, or if I'm praying for healing and deliverance, is Jesus glorified? That's the biggest question we can ask ourselves, right? So if Jesus is glorified, I know it is the leading of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, is it righteous? Now, we can do many things. We can do good things in a wrong way. And can we do wrong things in a good way? Everyone with me? We can do good things in a wrong way and wrong things in a good way. Is it righteous? The way I am doing things, the way I'm speaking, the way I'm ministering, is it, is it how the Holy Spirit would minister? Is it righteous? Is it looking right in the sight of God? These are questions we must ask ourselves. Right? Okay, we'll take a break. We'll come back. And importantly, we'll get into the next portion, how the Holy Spirit speaks to us through our senses. Let's take a break.